Welcome and thank you for checking out our service. Make sure to visit our website, sardiniacc.com, or download our church app to stay up to date and connected with everything going on here at SCC. And no matter where you're tuning in from today, we hope that this message encourages you and challenges you to follow Jesus and make disciples. God bless, and we hope to see you soon at one of our live in-person worship gatherings on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Well, hey there, happy Labor Day. Thank you for spending some of your time this holiday weekend uh, with us, worshiping with us, looking at God's word with us. We are in week three of our identity theft series where we've been exploring all the ways that Satan tries to rob us of our true identity and replace it with a false one. Now, we've looked at the truth, all this series, that identities uh, are not found, identities are given. They aren't found, they're given. In fact, our identity was given to us by God, our creator. At creation, he gave us our identity. But we've also seen that we have a very crafty enemy. And because our identity has been given to us, uh, we've also seen that it can easily be taken away. It can be stolen and last week, we explored the, the false identity that so many of us tend to, to buy into, and namely that we are what we do. We have this tendency to define ourselves by our jobs, our professions, our titles, our positions, our behavior, and our performance. And so this Labor Day weekend, we're, we're celebrating uh, the fact that we have uh, a chance to pause, a chance to rest, but that's where God has always wanted us to find our identity because uh, whenever we try to find our identity in what we do, we end up working and working harder and harder until we're at this point of exhaustion, but all we're trying to do is keep our identity in the things we do in our performance. But God gave us rest and freedom that comes from defining ourselves not by what we've done, but what he's done for us for us in Christ. And so today we're going to look at another theft tactic that Satan tends to use to get us to find our identity in something else other than God. Last week we looked at the lie that you are what you do. This week we're going to look at the lie you are what you have. Satan wants us to find our identity in what we have. I mean, we live in this very consumer-driven culture. Uh, we want and we, we spend and we see and we buy and we work hard and hard so that we can spend hard and play hard, right? We accumulate and accumulate. We, we hope that all the things that we have will give us identity. They'll give us meaning and purpose in life. Anyone in here, uh, anyone out there grow up on uh, 
knockoff brands, you know, the off brands, the store brands, not the name brands. Uh, you know, I can remember being a young middle school student and, and wanting so badly to fit in with everybody at school. And back in the day, back during my adolescence years, when I was in junior high, the way to fit in was by fitting into a pair of baggy jeans, baggy pants, all right? You weren't anybody unless you had baggy jeans. And I'm not talking about, you know, just a little loose around the thighs or the ankles. I'm talking they had to be so wide, your pants legs had to be so wide that you could practically slide your whole body through one of the legs. And the top brand uh, back in 1997 was Jinko Jeans. Maybe, maybe you remember some of these if you're around my age. If you had a pair of these Jinko Jeans, you were in, my friend. Uh, I wanted some of these pants so bad uh, because I believed if I had these pants, if I had these baggy jeans, then I would be in too. Uh, the, the problem is I couldn't afford to be in. Like as a middle school student, I had no job. I had no money. Uh, and so I asked my parents for some. They couldn't afford for me to be in, to have these kind of jeans. You know what I'm saying? So uh, guess who showed up to his sixth grade class wearing knockoff baggy pants? And I'm not just talking about uh, any knockoff brand. I'm talking about J.C. Penney on sale clearance section didn't look the slightest bit like Jinko jeans, baggy jeans. Yeah, guess who that was? This guy right here. I remember telling myself at that point that when I get older, when I get a job, when I make money of my own, uh, I was going to buy myself a pair of those Jinko jeans. I was going to have my own baggy jeans. Nobody could tell me I couldn't have them. The problem is when I finally got to the point where I could uh, start making my own money, uh, baggy jeans were no longer in style anymore. It was uh, skinny jeans that were in. And let me tell you what, guess who's not wearing a pair of skinny jeans? That's right, this guy, okay? Yes, you're welcome. But you know, there are, are many folks out there today like I was then who are trying to purchase or buy an identity for themselves. Uh, they're driven by this desire to have the newest, the best stuff, the latest and greatest, uh, because without it, I don't feel like I'm anybody. But you know, it's, it's not just jeans anymore. You know, for, for me, it's, it's things like um, the house or the car or uh, vacations. Maybe for you, it's, it's uh, jewelry or the latest and greatest technology and devices. And you feel like you have to have... Because if you don't, well, then who am I? And so uh, you continue to earn and spend so that you can have an identity. Right? Uh, fellas, I want you to think about this for a second. Some of you out there are driving around in a car or a truck that you couldn't really afford to impress people that you don't really even like. And the worst part of it is, is that you're on the inside of that vehicle, so you can't even really see it. And it's all because we've allowed what we have to define who we are. But you know, possessions aren't the only thing that we can have that we can find an identity in. Some of us, uh, some of us have a talent, and that talent is what gives us meaning. Who we are is wrapped up in our ability to, to do something uh, impressive that other people can't. Some of us might have a, a hobby, a hobby that we really, really enjoy. In fact, we enjoy it so much it's become our life. Every uh, waking moment, every extra penny we have is devoted to that hobby. Some of us might have a, a family name or a family money. Some of us have good looks. And so our value and worth comes from our genetics and our, our bone structure. Or, or maybe, maybe uh, your value is in having the cutest boyfriend or girlfriend, right? You have the perfect relationship. Who you are is wrapped up in who you're, you're with. You know, there's a lot of things we can have. We can have a title. We can have an exclusive membership. We can have intelligence or experience. Maybe some of you uh, have something that you wish didn't define you. 
So, so instead of having money and possessions, what you have is debt. And you wish more than anything you didn't have that. Uh, or maybe when it comes to talent or looks, you feel like you wound up in the shallow end of the gene pool. Uh, maybe what you have is some kind of shortcoming or disability. Or maybe instead of having uh, a great family, a great parents, maybe you wound up with abusive ones. The thing is, when we uh, build who we are around what we have, then we end up doing one of two things. If we like what we have, then we do everything we can to keep it. Right? It's, not, it's not enough to just have money. We do everything we can to keep it or, or to get more. And so we worry about things like our savings and our investments. Right? Every couple of years, we become afraid. We fear that someone might get elected who's going to take that away from us. They're going to take away our money. And so we work hard uh, to protect it. We work hard to make more and more and more. But as they say, more money, more problems, right? I mean, eventually the things you own end up owning you if you're not careful. If you've ever had a, maybe a condo or a boat or any kind of investment like that, you know what I'm talking about. But, but the things that we have, if they define us, we'll do everything in our power to keep them. It's not enough to have good looks. When you find your identity in that, you have to keep your looks. And so you work hard and spend all your money to maintain the way you look and take it from somebody who knows, man, it's exhausting, right? <laughs> Just kidding. But if we like what we have, we have to keep it. Otherwise, we lose who we are. But if we don't like what we have, then we find ourselves doing everything we can to get rid of it. Maybe what you have is you have a past, right? a history. You have a reputation, and it's one that you're not proud of. It's one that haunts you from time to time, and you wish for nothing more than for it to go away, but it won't. And so the way you get rid of it is you try to avoid it. You try to run away from your past at all costs. One Christian author said, uh, building our identity on the foundation of what we have means that we'll always be focused on ourselves. And he goes on to call it a lonely experience. It always leaves us searching for more, searching for something else. And that's where the identity thief wants us to be. He wants to leave us in this lonely isolated place where we're always wanting more. Satan is always whispering in your ear, uh, yes, yes, if you just buy that, that new purchase, that will make you happy. Or if you could just have this over here, it'll give you meaning and purpose. That, that person, that relationship, that is what will fulfill you. You'll, you'll never be happy until you have this. But the happiness never lasts. Satisfaction never stays. Before we have whatever it is, it always seems so promising. But once we have it, all we feel is disappointment. And, and on top of that, when we buy into the lie that we are what we have, we fall into a trap. Those things become a prison of sorts for us. We become slaves to the things that we have. We can become slaves to our money or our looks or our talent because without them, we don't know who we are. And maybe that's where you find yourself today. You're lonely, you're disappointed, you're exhausted, you're unsatisfied with life, you feel trapped, you feel enslaved. You know, there was another person in Scripture that felt that way too. Uh, before Paul became uh, the most influential leader in the Christian faith, uh, before he wrote a third of the New Testament, Paul thought that he had it all. He, he was the envy of everyone. He was the talk of the town. And it all had to do with what he had, all the things he had going for him. I want you to listen to how Paul describes himself before he met Christ. This is Philippians chapter 3. He says, if someone else thinks they have a reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. 
Now, when you or I read that list, we don't necessarily you know, perk up at those things and think, wow, man, this guy had it going for him, right? But when we understand what having these things meant to someone living in first century Palestine, it starts to make a little more sense. You see, Paul really did have it going for him. Uh, he had the right pedigree. He says he was circumcised on the eighth day. That meant that he was born into the most religious, uh, most patriotic of families. He was the most Jewish of all Jewish boys from the tribe of Benjamin. That means he came from the right part of the country. He grew up with the right family name, right? No one could dispute that. Uh, a Pharisee, he said he calls himself a Pharisee, it meant he had the right credentials, uh, he had the most prestigious education. As a Pharisee, he was trained by the best of the best. I mean, the dude basically went to the Harvard of ancient Israel. He calls himself a persecutor of the church. That would have been considered among the elite as the most uh, prestigious job in the land. I'm talking Paul would have had a corner office with the fattest paycheck uh, to come along with it. I mean, Paul was basically living the American dream before it was such a thing. And to top it off, Paul claims that he was faultless when it came to obeying the Old Testament law. Legally speaking, I mean, he's saying, I've, I had a squeaky clean record, not even a parking ticket, man. His claim to fame, what he believe, uh, believed was the best thing he had, the, the, the greatest thing he had going for him uh, that made him better than anyone else was that he had a righteousness that came from his strict obedience to a uh, list of religious rules, a moral code. In other words, he had pride. But then he met Jesus, and all of that changed because he realized that he had been putting all of who he was in what he had rather than what was available to him, what he could have had in Christ. So he continues in verse 7. He says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. You see, Paul realized that he had nothing Everything he had was nothing when it came uh, to knowing Christ, when it was compared to finding who he was in him. In fact, he, he goes as far as to say what? That everything he considered it what? Garbage. Everything else is garbage. It's trash. It's rubbish. Now keep in mind, uh, as Paul is writing this, he's sitting in a jail cell. Okay, And first century prisons were far from a stay at the Ritz, if you know what I mean. Uh, he's calling all of these things that he, he had, he's calling them garbage, as he's probably literally sitting next to real garbage. The, the food rations that he got in prison were probably just one step above garbage. And yet, he considered Everything that he had, the, 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 what gave him the essence of his being, his entire life, all these things that used to give him meaning and purpose and value, he now considers them trash compared to knowing Jesus. Why is that? Well, it's because for so long, Satan, the identity thief, had been trying to get him to find his identity in what he had. All those things he listed, it just, again, it brought about loneliness, isolation, disappointment, slavery. Satan wanted him to find those things, uh, find his identity in those things, rather than listening to what God had said about him, who says our identity is in what we have through Christ. You see, the identity thief, he wants us to find our identity in what we have, but God says our identity is in what we have through Christ. So sitting in a prison, Paul claims that he had been freed from this prison of a false identity. 
He was no longer a slave to those things. All those things that he owned, whether they were tangible or not, those things no longer owned him. He was free from all of that now. Now now he was living out his true identity. He said, I count all those things as a loss, right? And instead, now I'm going to live in the light of everything I have gained, everything that I have now. In his letter to the Ephesian church, which he also wrote from prison, he he gives another list, and and this one is a list of all the things that he has now, all the things that he gained from being in Christ, from living in relationship with Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So right off the bat, uh, Paul says, look, I have everything already. Every spiritual blessing you could think of, anything I'll ever need, I have that already in Christ. And then he goes on, verse 4. He says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will. Now, now Paul's going to continue on here. That list he gave in Philippians, he's going to contrast it here a little bit. Uh, He says, now look, you might think that you have the best family. You came from uh, the most prestigious family here on earth. And Paul says, you know, I certainly believe that about myself. But in Christ, you have been adopted into a divine family. Or maybe before, maybe before you thought you had lousy parents, you thought you had the worst family possible, but in Christ you now have a a heavenly father who is pleased with you. You have a heavenly father who loves you for you. Verse 7, he says, In him we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. So in Christ, we we find that we also have redemption and forgiveness and grace. Let me tell you, we need all three of those things, and yet nothing in this world, nothing this world offers uh, provides us with those. No amount of money you have can redeem your sinful nature. There's, uh, There's nothing you can trade or barter or sell to obtain forgiveness for sinning against an almighty, eternal God. Uh, There's no lineage, talent, or intelligence that can qualify you for grace. You see, all of those things, they are unmerited. They are not for sale. You can't earn them, and you cannot have them apart from the Lord. He continues, he says, With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed, in Christ. Paul says, look, in Christ you have the knowledge of God's will. I mean, you might think you have wits, you might think you have have brains, but I'm telling you, with Christ you can know God's will. You can know what the Lord wants for the world. In Christ you have access to the heart and mind of God himself. Jump down to verse 13. He says, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. He says, look, in Christ, you also have this inclusion. You've been included. You have uh, belonging. You see, Paul, Paul no longer was concerned about what belonged to him, you know, all the things he had, what belonged to him, because his only concern now was that his life was all about to whom he belonged. He also said we have salvation. In Christ, we have the hope of eternity spent with our Heavenly Father. And then he goes on and he says, And when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise, uh, to the praise of his glory. So he says, In Christ... We have the Holy Spirit. You have the very Spirit of God living inside of you. 
And, and then finally, he says, in Christ we have this inheritance. And he's not just talking about a, a worldly inheritance you know, of, of wealth. He's saying, look, you can be the richest person in the world. Your net worth can be uh, more than that of Bill Gates and, and Jeff Bezos combined. But that doesn't even come close to what God has in store for those who are in Christ. You see, in Christ we have everything. Nothing we could ever have in this world even comes close to comparing to it. Uh, you know, in Atlanta, uh, if you've ever been down that way, it's kind of, I'm from the Atlanta area, uh, but there's a famous restaurant down there called The Varsity, uh, whose, whose claim is they're the world's largest drive-in restaurant. Uh, now, before the pandemic started, uh, in its downtown location of The Varsity uh, served roughly 25,000 people per day, just that one location. Uh, the staples on its menu at the, at the Varsity are fresh hot dogs and chili. Uh, you could probably maybe compare it to uh, the Skyline or Gold Star of the South, uh, except that it's actually good. Um, they, they serve real hot dogs, real chili. Uh, but going to the Varsity is an experience uh, from the second you, know, you pull in with your car, you step up to the counter inside to place your order, you are greeted by an enthusiastic employee who shouts, What'll you have? And from there, the choice is yours. And friends, that's where I want to leave you today. I want to leave you with this question. What'll you have? You see, are you going to continue to let all the things that you have define who you are? Are you going to keep working yourself ragged until you're exhausted so you can keep holding on to what you have because those things are what give your life meaning and value? Or will you choose to have an identity that's based on what God has for you in Christ? Will you find your value and your worth in what uh, God has said about you, what God has said you already have because of Jesus? Or, or will you keep uh, choosing to uh, identify yourself with what you wish you didn't have, what you're trying to always get rid of in your life? You're trying to get rid of something uh, because it's become who you are. Or will you allow God to redeem those things? Will you allow him to turn what you don't have or what you, what you wish you didn't have into the greatest testimony of his faithfulness, of, of his ability to bless you uh, with the richest blessings through his grace, uh, blessings that can only come from your heavenly father? You see, no matter what you have or don't have, no matter what circumstances you're going through right now, the trials in your life that you're facing, whatever life has handed you, God wants you to be reminded today that in Christ, in his son, you have everything. In Christ, you really can have it all, even when it feels like you, you don't have anything by the world's standards. And so today I'm going to ask you one more time, what do you have? Because if you want it, you can have it. If, if you're tired of always feeling like what you have is who you are, then I want to invite you to answer Jesus' call to follow him. Because in him, you have love and grace. You have forgiveness and friendship and healing and hope and comfort. You have protection, provision, and peace. In Christ, we have joy. In Christ, we have everything we'll ever need. In him, we have our identity. We have who we are. Pray with me. Father, forgive us when we look to our bank account or our financial assets or our possessions or a relationship, or our brains, or our status, our talents, or anything else that we have to give us meaning and purpose and value and worth in this life. God, forgive us when we make our lives about uh, what we don't have, what we lack, because the truth is that in Christ we lack nothing. You gave us everything you have when you gave us Jesus. And you have said that it's in him 
and only in him that we find our true selves, that we have our true identity. So God, we just ask that you would help us to stop looking to all those other things, hoping that we'll find who we are and what we have. And instead, you'll help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, who gave it all so that we could have it all. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us today and spending your holiday weekend with us. We hope that you will have a uh, blessed rest of your weekend. Also, just want to remind you that uh, all this month we're kicking back off our student ministry with uh, Sunday morning programming for our middle school students, Sunday evening programming for our high school students. We also have our church picnic coming up in just a couple weeks on September 20th. Be looking out for more details about how you can be involved with that. Love you guys. We'll see you next time.